Hey, I'm Alex Rackle from Board Game Co, and today I'm reviewing The Court of Miracles, a game from Lucky Duck Games for 2 to 5 players that plays in roughly 30 to 40 minutes, and this is going to be an area control experience. See, in The Court of Miracles, you're fighting over control of 5 different neighborhoods in this game, and the, the main gameplay, the main way you're going to win this game, is by getting all your tokens onto the board. Every player has 6 tokens, and those tokens are going to go on the board, both into individual neighborhoods, as well as into the courtyard over here, and once you get your 6 token on the board, that's it you win the game. That, that's that's it. That's really all that's going on here. But the actual gameplay is going to come down to taking a token on your turn, putting it into a neighborhood, taking the bonus, and then it's the next player's turn. Blue goes ahead, takes a token, puts it face down. You will not know the tokens the players are placing. And he goes ahead and puts it over here, and he advances the king's token one. And then white's going to go ahead and take one of their tokens, and they're going to go ahead and put it over here, drawing a card, and then triggering a standoff in that neighborhood. Once that neighborhood is completely full, a standoff will be triggered, at which point you reveal the very tokens of that neighborhood and you see who has the highest strength in this case there's gonna be a tie for one and one and we're going to look at whoever's closest to the plus symbol which is going to be blue which means blue is going to win that standoff over here but the good news is white I think it is orange is going to go ahead and steal one coin from the winning player so there's a bit of an interplay of when you try to win when you're trying to mess with the players when you're trying to bluff them and that interplay will develop further as you start to level up your tokens because there's an entire bag full of tokens that each give different abilities they add more strength, they add more variability, they add more options for both the mind games you can play with each other and the abilities at your disposal. And so you're going to try to manipulate the game to get better tokens at different points in the game and to use those tokens to your advantage in different neighborhoods. Once you gain control of a neighborhood, you're going to go ahead and put one of your tokens in that neighborhood. And then at that point, from there on in, every player who goes to that neighborhood will effectively be earning you a coin income. So you, in addition to the fact that you get a token on the board, which is one of the ways you win the game, which is the way you win the game, you'll also be earning income along the way. And that's going to be important for getting your tokens into this row over here. Because in this card row on the sideboard, when you have enough money and utilize the ability, you'll be able to go ahead and put tokens down into the side row, earning the benefits of that row, as well as getting one of your tokens to the board. And these tokens, unlike the neighborhoods, can never be removed. Those neighborhoods, as soon as someone else triggers another conflict and gets their own token in, then your token will be removed and someone else will be the new king of the neighborhood or whatever. Uh, the main variability in this game is going to come from the cards and the tokens over here. There's a lot of interplay between the way the cards will affect the game state. So for instance, we have this card over here, which is going to trigger a standoff in a neighborhood with two tokens from other players, from, from two enemy, two different players in that neighborhood, which means you can use these cards to do things your opponents don't expect. In this case, triggering a conflict when other people are not perhaps ready for it. You'll also be able to steal money from other players. You'll be able to draw tokens, different things that will improve your gameplay experience in ways that, well, your opponents do not. These tokens, like I said already, will give you different abilities that will mix up that experience. And past that, there's a few other things to note, such as for instance, this king's token, as it moves along the board, as it hits certain markers, it will trigger conflicts in that neighborhood, regardless of whether that neighborhood is full or not. And that's going to be a key thing in this game, a key aspect of the timing of the game, is going to be moving the king's token and ensuring that you are not just ready for where it is, but rather you are prepped and potentially moving it in a way that benefits yourself. And when you move to one of these silver spots, well, that's where you're going to have a lot more control because when you move it to a silver spot, you get to trigger a conflict in the neighborhood of your choosing, and obviously you'll do so in a place that most benefits yourself. That is going to be the core gameplay of the Court of Miracles. It's roughly, like I said, roughly half hour long experience of just tense knife fighting back and forth in small condensed areas. It's area control with not a lot of room for growth and development, which simultaneously adds and takes away from the game, and we'll, we'll get into that part now, I guess. So, so, so what do I think of the Court of Miracles? And, and this one was a tough one for me, because there are things that I like about the game, and things that I don't like about the game, and ultimately, this is one that will not be staying in my collection, although, for a while there, I thought it would. You see, the Court of Miracles starts off, and you read the rules, or in my case, I read the rules, and... I wasn't really sure what to expect. I didn't get the sense or the feeling that there was enough variation in what you could actually do. Starting the game with two ones and a zero, the ability to unlock a two and then potentially develop your bag as you go, it didn't feel like there was a lot of room for doing things in this game. And then the main abilities of the neighborhoods, all these neighborhoods, when you put a token down, the abilities come down to drawing cards, taking coins, or moving the king's token. Now, now that space does open up a bit as you go to the rewards of the neighborhood, because then you can do other things like drawing tokens from the bag, upgrading those, getting your tokens in this in, in the main courtyard, which is going to be a fixed way to get points. So the game does open up and develop, especially with the use of those of those cards and the uh, tokens that you will upgrade. And so it does open up that decision space. But like I said, I walked in initially 
resistant, initially unsure of how this game was going to give me a deep enough experience that I would want to keep coming back to it. And then I got in game one. And then I got in game two and game three and game four. And I realized as I kept playing it that the, the, the tightness of this game comes specifically from the narrowed amounts of decisions you have in this game. What starts off as a game of how can I really get much done? How can I really add to the, the bluffing, the interplay, the abilities? You actually end up getting a lot more done, especially as you learn how to manipulate that king's token. The game does give you an interesting puzzle. And, and it's a simple to teach and quick to play game as well. But it gives you that interesting puzzle of, of trying to navigate. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and go over here. And I'm going to move the king's token too and then someone else is going to move the king token one and boom we trigger a fight in that neighborhood there's a lot of interplay in specifically the tightness of the game and those cards these cards and all the abilities they provide are going to open up the gameplay experience just a drop take a card of your choice from the discard pile remove all rogue tokens from a neighborhood without triggering a standoff place a rogue token taking the action of that neighborhood instead of the action of the one you're in each player with more renowned tokens in play than you must give you a coin it's going to give you interesting abilities and decisions that that manipulate the game state just a drop and so getting the cards is going to be important, not just because the cards are beneficial, but more importantly because it means the other players cannot predict exactly what you're going to do. Which brings me to the part of the Court of Miracles, which is why I'm not keeping it in my collection, which is, as I played it more, that, that decision space started to close up again. What started off as me thinking there wouldn't be enough interplay and developing more as I played it, of giving me those choices, those decisions, and feeling like there actually was cleverness, the problem is because it's still a very tight amount of, of space you're working in, those decisions, while they open up, they also become predictable as you play it more. By the time we were at game four, Game one was, 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 was a surprise, it was a pleasant surprise. Game two and three were pretty solid as we went back and forth. Game four, was a predictable exercise and we've done these moves before we know exactly where and when you're going to feel clever as you play the game now don't get me wrong this is one of those times where i will always say there will always be a player out there who is far more strategic than i who has seen the depth of this game who understands exactly the ways to counter the moves the back and forth and that might make the court of miracles a game that's right for you for myself for our group we found that the court of miracles over-delivered on what we expected, at least initially, but then kind of capped out and became a bit stagnant as we played it more and more. The decision space in this game did not open up further past those initial strategies, and as we learned to predict those strategies, we just found ourselves just understanding, well, well, once the king's token is there, no one's going to go here because then it'll move there and it'll take advantage there. It was easier to counter the variable, the minimal amount of variation in the moves that actually allowed you to feel clever. At which point, at which point the main strategy of this game started to come from the cards and from the tokens, or more specifically, perhaps from the imbalance of the cards and the tokens. You see, not all cards and tokens in this game are created equal, which might be a problem for you, and it was certainly a bit of a problem for us. Some of the cards are going to be incredibly beneficial in what they allow you to do. Other cards will be steal a coin from one player, which is, is nice, but it's certainly not to the same level as triggering a standoff when it's more beneficial to you than when the game would otherwise suggest. And so that imbalance is going to be present in the cards, as well as it is in the tokens. The tokens, while I would I can I could hear the argument that all the tokens are evenly balanced, they are certainly not all evenly balanced situationally. So for instance, if a bunch of players have unlocked their twos and are fighting a much stronger game and you are down to your 0-1-1 and finding yourself unable to actually win any fights, well then drawing a three from the bag will be incredibly helpful. Drawing a three will enable you to suddenly be back in fights and perhaps to wrest control from other players versus drawing one of the you know zero power tokens that gives you a bit of ability manipulation may just not be the thing that currently helps you at this place and time and so we found that as we played the court of miracles the game started to come down more to the cards and the tokens players acquired rather than to the depths of strategy that they were able to unlock because we had we had gone through those motions before and so that that's ultimately how i feel about the court of miracles it's a game that that did deliver more than i thought based on reading the rules but as we played it more and more, it didn't give us enough variability. It didn't give us enough depth in the strategy, at least for ourselves, that we felt we were adding it to the my, adding it to our collection, my collection, our collection, and one of those two things. Uh, for myself, I rate the Court of Miracles three out of five. It's a solid game. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed my time with it. I think it, it it might be a better game for you. It might be a game that you might see more depth, more strategy, or perhaps you just don't mind the the fact that there is a limit 
to how many things you can do and the variation of those things in this game. The area control in this game is tight, it's tense. Like I said already, it is a knife fight in a back alley. It is, it is cutthroat as you try to fight over a very limited area of options that you have at your disposal. And the player count in this game will definitely matter as well. Playing it as a two player game versus a five player game will be a drastically different experience, especially as each neighborhood only has three spots to go in. And so whether you have the potential to go twice in a neighborhood before someone else does versus whether there's a guarantee, almost guarantee, that it will not come back to you before someone else goes there, those will definitely change up and mix up the experience you are having with the Court of Miracles. And that's ultimately going to be my review of the Court of Miracles by Lucky Duck Games. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co., and I hope you have a good one.